speaker is Steve Finley. He's a civilian member of uh, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP. Uh, he is the Secretary Treasurer of LEAP. And uh, Steve, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I don't particularly like being sitting behind a table like that when I'm talking. Uh, as Mark said, I am the Secretary Treasurer, not of LEAP, but of LEAP Canada, the Canadian branch of LEAP. I am a civilian member of LEAP. That means that I am here today as a stand-in. All official LEAP speakers are law enforcement professionals, current or retired. I'm not one of those. Unfortunately, none of our professional speakers were available for this event today. So I'm here as a stand-in, and when I talk about the things that they have said, as much as possible, I'm going to give you their exact words. Because I'm not here for you to listen to me. I'm here for you to listen to them, not to me. We do have with us Rick Maddox. Rick Maddox is a LEAP member, a law enforcement professional, who is going to become a speaker soon. So you can get the professional perspective at any time from Rick. Thank you, Rick, very much. Now, first of all, LEAP's position on marijuana legalization. I want to make this absolutely clear. LEAP's position is not that marijuana should be legalized because it is safer than alcohol or because it has medicinal benefits. Even though those things are true, that is not LEAP's position. LEAP's position is that marijuana should be legalized because prohibition is a terrible policy. That is our position. As I talk about this, I'm going to say a few things between now and the end of my talk that at first may sound extreme. At first, some of the things I say, your reaction might be, you've got to be kidding. That, that goes too far. I assure you, however, that when <coughs> you have done the research, when you've listened to the people who have real experience in the real world with this policy of prohibition, when you look at what really happens without prejudging it, you will end up finding that everything I say is not extreme at all, it is simply the truth. What I'm going to tell you about marijuana, and about prohibition rather, what I'm going to tell you about prohibition is the absolute truth. So, I'm going to talk about three general things. First, the direct effects of prohibition. Second, some of the broader indirect effects of it. And third, the effect on law enforcement, which is something that's often neglected, but our, our professional law enforcement members are really very, very aware of, because they lived it. They lived it in their professional lives, in many cases for decades. First of all, the direct effects of prohibition. And I'm going to run through them fairly quickly because I suspect that Jody and Donald will have a lot to say about these as well. At least five direct effects from prohibition. Number one, no reduction in drug use or drug abuse. None. And that's important because every time somebody opposes legalization, one of the things I hear them say is, we can't deal with the increase in drug use that's going to happen. That increase in drug use is a unicorn. No such animal. We know when we compare countries with less extreme drug laws to those with more extreme drug laws, such as Netherlands to the U.S., there is less drug use in the Netherlands. Portugal to the U.S., there's less drug use in Portugal. And when you compare the U.S. now to the U.S. 40 years ago, after 40 years of intensifying enforcement and intensifying prohibition, drug use is up, the drug supply is up. So, number one, prohibition does not reduce drug use. Proven by every form of statistic and experience we can look at. Second, pretty obvious, prohibition gives, you, gives enormous wealth and power to criminal gangs. Because what prohibition means is here we are, the government, we will make this business extremely profitable because by prohibiting it, the price goes up. And we will give you, organized crime, a monopoly over it. That's what prohibition does. They get very rich, very powerful. As, one of, as our members always say, pro, or alcohol did not create Al Capone. Alcohol prohibition created Al Capone. Third, one of the effects is property crime committed by addicts. 
if you think about it, the drugs make somebody want to steal. Is there a drug that I can take that will make me walk out and steal something? No, there isn't. What makes me walk out and steal something if I'm an addict is the price of the drug. That is inflated by prohibition. In Switzerland, when they started supplying heroin to addicts under prescription, under prescription at no charge, property crime committed by addicts dropped 90%. Prohibition causes that harm. Fourth, prohibition causes violent crime by the gangs who are fighting over the business. This is always advertised as so-called drug-related violence, but think about it. When you hear about a murder, a stabbing, a beating related to drugs, was the guy who did it on drugs? No, they weren't. They were being paid by one criminal gang to get rid of somebody from another. Or think about it this way. In the 20s in Chicago, what would have been more dangerous to your health? To get between an alcoholic and his booze? Or to get between Al Capone and his money? There's nothing different now. You're not going to get too much in trouble getting in between a heroin addict and his heroin. You're very unhappy perhaps, but your life is not going to be at risk. Get between the Hells Angels and their money? Now you have a problem. And finally, the other effect of prohibition is high costs to taxpayers. The U.S. government, levels of government in the U.S. spend 70 billion per year on prohibition. Uh, you all know about the basic one-tenth rule, everything in Canada is roughly one-tenth the size of the U.S. So if we were spending money at the same rate, we'd be spending seven billion a year. Now we aren't, uh, the late Jerry Parody, lead speaker and board member before he passed away, estimates the amount we are spending at around 2.3 billion. So we aren't wasting as much money as the U.S. yet, but Harper's working on it. So, that's just the direct effects. I'm going to go on in a minute to the broader effects and to the effects on law enforcement. But just from those direct effects, you can see why Norm Stamper, Leap Speaker, retired police chief in Seattle, says, I think the drug war has been arguably the single most devastating, dysfunctional, harmful social policy since slavery. That's in the U.S. Now, we haven't had slavery in Canada, so I think that puts prohibition number one up here in being devastating, dysfunctional, and harmful, as Norm says. Now, all of these direct effects are absolutely predictable from the economic theory point of view. Now, I'm not being a stand-in when I say this, because economics is my training. I specialize in public policy economics doing my MBA. And I can assure you, there is no such thing, nowhere, as an economist who thinks prohibition is a good idea. The effects of prohibition are absolutely predictable if you understand economics. The mechanism is very simple. The demand for drugs doesn't go away. There's always going to be some percent of the population demanding drugs, alcohol, whatever. Prohibition, however, makes the price for those drugs go up that makes the profit go up. When the profit goes up, no matter how many drug dealers you jail, no matter how many in places like Iran they execute, or Singapore they execute, because the profit is so high there will be someone else willing to try to make that money and step in and provide that product. Economists know this is going to happen and every time something is done relating to prohibition. If you're an economist you can immediately see, oh I know what's going to happen next does. Never fails. Not just economists, law enforcement as well. And now, I'll give you what some of our LEAP members say. Here's Jerry Cameron, retired police chief from Florida. And I sort of apologize for this bit, because when I quote Jerry, it's almost impossible to do it without going into Jerry's accent. So here's what he told us. And this is demonstrating the mechanism I just talked about. I remember taking a small area of my community and completely cleaning it up, trampling all over the edges of the Constitution to do so, and, and getting all of the dope dealers out of there. 
in two matches May, 90 days later. I had a Haitian group to move in from downstate. I had the Miami boys to move in from Jacksonville, and they were shooting machine guns and beating people mercilessly. And I wanted my old dope dealers back. That's the effect of enforcement. Somebody else comes in probably worse than who you had. Neil Franklin, LEAP's executive director, with 30 years experience as a narcotics cop in Maryland City Police, uh, sorry, Maryland State Police, Baltimore City Police, Maryland Transit Police. Mar Baltimore's his hometown. Anybody ever seen the series The Wire? On each of you The Wire? The Wire is about Maryland. Neil says The Wire is basically a documentary. Here's how he describes what happened. Baltimore went through a metamorphosis from a thriving city with thriving communities and healthy neighborhoods to sheer devastation and disaster. And why did this occur? It occurred because of drug prohibition. Not because people use drugs. People were using drugs in Baltimore for a long time before the 1970s and the 1980s. But when we broke up those organizations, as depicted in the wire, who had agreements among themselves to conduct their business in a certain way, when we broke up those organizations, we made way because the void wasn't going to remain there, it's a lucrative market. So we made way for hundreds of young entrepreneurs to enter the business, and the only way that they knew how to manage that market share was with violence. And Neil goes around when he's back in Baltimore and drives around the neighborhood where he grew up and where his mother still lives, which he says it was a thriving neighborhood with strong schools, strong community, businesses, uh, every house occupied, and he grew up drives past the open-air drug markets, the boarded-up homes, the vacant lots, the burned-out businesses. So there's the, the summary of the direct effects of prohibition, the economic reasons, and how our elite members know from experience that that economic dynamic is really what happens. They've seen it over and over and over again. 